I feel very fortunate tonight to represent the organization COG in our first event in this space and uh, I think our first outdoor event in quite a while. Our first event with a new projector, our technical abilities have gone up and with two uh, fantastic guests. I'm just going to say a little thank you to those that need to be thanked and then turn it over to the first um, introducer. And then after that, I'll come back and introduce the, the second uh, presenter. First presenter tonight will be Rodrigo Toscano and the second one, Barbia Williams. So Pog uh, would like to thank our sponsors who are, uh, who among them are the Arizona Commission on the Arts and Poets and Writers. We also have many individual and organizational donors, patrons, sponsors, who I'm just collectively going to thank them all and uh, say that if you want to join them, uh, you can look up, you know, POG on Google or pogartstucson.org specifically. I know I'm going to forget something because I forgot my script entirely. But, um, it's off script. I do want to say that we are fully aware that we present these events on and in land that um, has been lived on and in by people from the time of the Hohokam some 2,000 plus years ago to the Moadam and Pima and Yaki and at other times in history, various other peoples too, and that we hope that we celebrate and present you things that celebrate and do honor to the place that this is and those traditions that have been here for so long. I also want to say that Bach tries as much as possible to be a safe space for everyone. And if for any reason someone feels uncomfortable, uh, bothered by anyone else, and you want to speak to one of our directors about it, uh, raise your hand if you're one of the directors. OK. That's fantastic. And so then beyond that, I just want to welcome you here, and I hope you come again and again. Our next event is not until April 29th, and it is a reading by Jen Scapatoni and, and two other local poets who <laughs> I don't have written down here yet. but. Um, and we're looking forward to that. That event will be at our more usual location, which is the Steinfeld Warehouse at 101 West 6th Street. Okay. Oh, I also want to really thank the people here at Proper Shops. Um, I am fortunate to have uh, Brian Dahl, who works here, who introduced me to this space. And he introduced me to Tracy and Crystal, who help uh, run this space and they were you know absolutely wonderful to let us in and very generous um, about us being here so thank you to them and now i want to welcome carlos gallego who will do the next chapter here thank you uh good evening to everyone um i want to start by giving biographical information so i don't forget i was uh, asked to do so so our speaker is uh, Rodrigo Toscano, who comes to us uh, by means of uh, what New Orleans, and is the uh, author of eleven books, and uh, is a uh, I would say a labor activist working out of uh, working with multiple organizations, and especially the Labor Institute of New York, right? Yes. So. Uh, and I've known Rodrigo for several years now at this point, and it's not the first time I introduce him at a poetry reading, but I nevertheless find the task a bit daunting. Uh, as, as one of the blurbs on his most recent publication, Cup Point States, um, he is, quote, one of the great civilizational poets of our time. So uh, with that kind of blurb, 
uh, from Edward Garcia, which I don't disagree with, I'm always uh, impressed uh, by the thematic consistency that Rodrigo's poetry retains, despite his uh, courageous exploration of new forms and genres. Uh, but to me, his poetry is weirdly but consistently insightful, often hilarious, and unflinchingly political. Uh, so how does one introduce a poet slash friend who, is willingly, who willingly antagonizes the very concept of poetry itself, including the concepts of the poet and the reader. To avoid a categorizing a poet that refuses categorization, I decided to offer by way of an introduction, uh, and I think the word primer works better in this context, uh, a brief collage of some of the lines that stood out to me when reading through Cut Point. You're reading about colonialism again, you're writing about material entanglement. You're vocalizing empires crack up again. Your whole life is brained up by designs of others alongside others executing plans. This density of intentions is the world you navigate even in sleep. Del Diwakan, teeming plazas. Granite serpents. Sorry. This is my favorite one, so. Curly Toms wants to write a piece called Lithium Girls. 30,000 linemen and bucket trucks streaming into your distressed environs, hitting 16 hour shifts, repairing lines that keep your identities well lit. By around the fifth day, you're, the, you're like the rest, overheated, exhausted, half crazy, and perhaps becoming dimly aware linemen have zero power in the arts. From the playful criticism of Magnolia's colonialism, again, to the marketing language uh, of a seeming Teotihuacan advertisement in civilizational and back again to the grounded materiality of how our lives are perpetually powered by invisible populations of laborers in linemen, Rodrigo's playful poetics can be, to use a football analogy, easily flagged for unnecessary roughness, a penalty that I'm sure he's happy to accept. And so I humbly ask you to help me welcome back to Tucson, quote, one of the greatest civilizational poets of our time, Rodrigo Toscano. Um, hi, everybody. So I'm just going to jump right into it. I'm going to read from two uh, uh, collections. Uh, the, the book just came out just now called The Cut Point, and the other one is called The Charm and the Dread. And that one came out uh, last year at around this time. Songsters. How did people procreate around these parts? 50 years ago? Under what conditions? 100 years ago? By what constraints and liberties? 200 years ago? To what ends? With what means? 400 years ago? What rituals impelled? What songs propelled? 800 years ago? What songs were deemed fit and by whom? 1,600 years ago, songsters back at camp sampling other camps, compressing and fitting old songs to new times. 3,200 years ago, call it quits on rituals, rituals purpose, till a direction, a journey is divined. 6,400 years ago, songsters vying who's shining Who's not? 12,800 years ago, vanguards in tatters, retrofitted, jimmied just long enough to make relevance. Right? The city. What's the point of New York City? Or, for that matter, Calgary? or any city on a hill, 
or hidden far beneath the waves, any city at any time, any city planned or dreamt of. What's the point of males and females? What's the rub with transportation, movement of foodstuffs, or the arts, distributions of new pleasures, or the same old ones year by year, making for a steady story? What's the point of stock characters, emotions bundled or spread out, arguments over arguments, escape from argumentation, fantastical propositions, promises to extend a hand. What's the point of scheduling things all in tandem or at random through avenues, streets, and alleys, secreted, secreted forever, or spilled onto morning pavement, draining into holes, seaward bound? What's the point of that lingerie? That ties length and width and color frame from overuse or disuse, weighing X amount per square ton, legs, rubber arms, cotton eyes, steel. What point in writing the city? Magnolias. This shade casting magnolias getting involved with your breathing. Or is it better put, was always involved with your breathing. This shade casting magnolia is oblivious to poetic encirclement. Or is it better put, becoming aware of escape routes. You're reading about colonialism again? You're writing about material entanglement. You're vocalizing empires crack up again. Shaded and shading magnolias, maybe like 20 after hard rain, make a point at midday. The sun quacking on about technique. This not being Kabul, this being Kabul, after all, radiative Global New Grammar, Magnolias, moist and steamy, vanishing from the scene, poof, that is, dragooned to the task and hating it. So this next one is, uh, you know, NOLA, N-O-L-A, that's obviously New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, Louisiana. Sometimes people don't know that. So, okay, so no, no. And this poem is called Endless Summer Nola. The unpaired or paired or semi-paired or multiply paired people and pestilence. She willed herself into a crush, self-gathering crush. Totality makes purpose. By and by, good tidings. By and by, the rough passage. Sick of the city and praising it. Fatigued by the country and roofing it up. He, what did he do? What he was he? How hardy a he hereabouts how? Pinging magnolia, pinging hydrangea, they preferred pewter flower rings. Random rain again, blinky twice. Random rain again, blinky thrice. Boats and planes, cars and trains, forehead on forehead, booty to booty. She, what did she do? What she was she? How hardy a she hear about howling? Singing is elsewhere. Dancing is elsewhere. The verified mammals hereabouts. They willed themselves out of frolicking. They willed themselves into frolicking. 
this splish splash, puddle ocean, shimmery, glowy, red new sun. Oh, the crush that never cometh. Oh, the crush that suffocateth. He became an ignorant gardener. She became a questionable baker. They saw the lights funk out. All at once, they flashed up. Purpose was waiting on the corner. The corner came into question. By and by, wild prophecies. By and by, drink cups cuddling. Again, the paired, unpaired, semi-paired, multiply paired, and pestilence. Here's a, a quick little sonnet uh, that Carlos quoted. It's called Phoebus Apollo. Wants to write a piece called Lithium Girls at around midday, gulf breezes humming, globes of water vapor rolling eastward, sporadic blasting sun droplets flashing. A mighty fine way to spend a Monday musing on carbon boys getting older, somewhat wiser, somewhat preserving clues, ciphers for lithium girls to decode. At dawn, dense fog rolling up the bayou, green, still shining waters reflecting moon. Why girls? Why boys? Why anyone at all? Silicon laminate undies aside, what's their poetic foreign policy? These bards on a Friday nearing midnight. <laughs> this poem uh, made it into the next collection. Um, I don't know. They, they took it. It's called Orpheus of Pensacola. Are tercets imperialist thugs? Now that the price of dicks has dropped, robotics minor? Poetrics. Shizutron swaps out 80 brains. One ton of MAGA flags docking. This listing skiff festooned in flak. Do octosyllabics repress? Dredge up Dr. Salubrico. Biometrics. Minor. Friction. Detecting Detter Joe's a cinch. 20 tons of dildos docking. Be fireball flex of carbonite. His description homicidal. Ask what dick brains go for these days. Genomics, minor, non fiction. Tweaking no tan tammies a hoot. 50 tons of bang dolls docking. Swirl jolly in the anarchy. This next one's it. The title piece of, of my new book. It's called "The Cut Point," and there's like a like a twenty-five dollar phrase in here for me at least. Uh, it, it, it's like a it's a Greek for "zoon politikon," means a political animal. But if I say it quickly, you won't understand. It's one political animal. So, so it's Aristotle's sort of basis of his sort of ethics. Uh, this one's called the, the Cut Point. The trash men do come, and that's a miracle, on top of the marble of home water heaters and central air cooling. Your whole life is brained up by designs of others alongside others executing plans. This density of intentions is the world you navigate, even in sleep. There's a grand rebellion against this world taking many forms. One such one is lyric poetry. These failed rebellions deep in the myths we tell ourselves about ourselves in kooky ways. Why has everything become rejoinders? Rejoinder on rejoinder, this ceaseless chat inflation. The trashmen know the cut point. AC repairs crew know the cut point. Some poets, maybe. 
the density is we, the needle to crop is we, and surely the rivet to plate is zon politikon. The likes and follows do come dressed as miracles, vaguely intentional, fizzling fast. Behold is an old word meant to you know, behold what's beholden to something. Say this is tough facet. The density of intention here calls up legions of poetic actors pushing limits. The water that flows is a cut point. The pipes that held it are cut points, the dam, the dials. But what about clouds? Have we rebelled against wily whisperings? Are clouds merely constructivisms? No matter, the trash men have arrived on top of the marvel of a number two pencil tracking the point. Oh, here's another little sign I'm gonna read. Just kind of surprising here. Um, this one's called Swap Out. There's no phrase in the entire English tongue that gives me the tingles more than swap out. Working folks don't trade up, let alone down. They simply swap out shit, folks, ideas. Something's not working? Have you tried and tried? Okay, swap that shit out, let's get moving. But the problem is, where get the parts and how? Let alone at the time when you need them. But even this tune of have-nots and haves is something we swap out if the tale's stale. Working folks, you've noticed, prefer new things. They thingify things to thingaramas. There's another phrase that's kin to swap out, and that is crap out. Most folks just crap out. I'm a political optimist. <laughs> and you shall see by this next poem, as it's titled, The Times, A Rhapsody for Activists. The times you stall, and by stalling, rocking. The times you're a dead board worker. The times a devoted worker with deep purpose. The times you're a thrill-seeking slacker. The times a genius co-worker without peers. You chose this, you chose dialectical wreck sensational. You pounce toward direct intense unknown. You've sloughed off crooked dick nationalism. You've blown up indolence on some occasions eloquence. Who can Velcro on a plasticized red wig when you want it? Who can supply you a bronze lion future beast of victory? The times you're a pre-pounce poet posing as pouncer. The times you're a post-pounce as twitchy-twitch. Not whatever. Never whatever. But this, you're a spectral socialist savage. You're a spectral socialist civilizer. You're a spectral socialist dirt clod on diamond. Who can futurize the people without the trademark? Who enacts fire canister hierarchical reforms? The times you carouse, and by carousing, arouse. The times you're hella, as you all say, cat with hiss and claws. The times you're a devotee to love slamming you to the ground. Did you really choose this gem? Art thou chosen? Are you ascending now towards free floating domes in the sky? Have you handily sloughed off sultry stance nationalism? The times nationalism offer surfaces left or right. The times intra nationalisms show a way out for a fee. Who can hyperspatialize the people without coordinates? Who enacts supersymmetrical justice reform? You're a spectral socialist bit actor. You're a spectral socialist stunt double. You're a spectral socialist 
diamond fleck on demon dung. The times, you rock it, and by rocketing, stall. The times, you stall, and by stalling, rock it. Okay, this one's called uh, Mannerbunde, which is the German word. Um, it seems like men's club, basically. So you know, so like a, a shooting club. It's just, they were very extent during the Weimar period, on which they eventually gobbled up by the National Socialists. Mannerbunde. Mannerbunde. Guns. Shedfuls of them. You'll see will not be the deciding factor in the big shift towards hemispheric autarky, no amount of rounds and clips hoarded in safes will rewrite labor laws that integrate Canadian, American, and Mexican biopower around a vision of itself protectively, economically, expansive, culturally, interposed maps of watersheds, routes of produce, conduits of clean energy, lasered in on healthy work and stable housing. The big shift doesn't require belly crawling, sharpshooters, Grown boy camps, manor bunda, sing alongs, pining after dreams of becoming sovereign when all's entangled already, except not formally and equitably, set to a higher order, resource conscious, confident future, commandeering hemispheres, collective wealth, material and psychic, brave projection, bulwark against this anarcho tyranny, faux nationalism, yacht, excursion for winners of. Rigged outcomes, swamp monsters becoming great again, promoting shedfuls of ammo, camel, grown up boy lingerie, boudoir, manor bunda, posing on towering trucks, performing sovereign when all's entangled already, but on a wobbly base with sideshows, gun shows, crouching, cowering, last gasps of sovereign kins, every man a surf owning nothing, not mineral deposits, not beds of technology, not downstream planning, educational cargo, material and psychic, oblivious to rising forces, integrated, autarkic, prosperous homelands to thrive in, where crotch grasping, gun toting, enfeebled copes flicker out year by year as hemispheric power looks outward with straight backs towards other autarkic regions working on integration of a higher order, looking outwards, mindfully negotiating globes, collective wealth, material, and psychic. And yeah, a few museums of nation states and even kinky cosplay might be entertaining on occasion to remind us of the age of Anarcho tyranny and its camo lingerie butlers on a leash, Mannerbunda. <laughs> Skipping over a lot of them. Oh. Okay, this one's called Inglisk. Done with you for the time being. Bayous, ducks, in Creole French, back and forth. In Castilian, laid off cooks in Tagalog at water's edge. In Celtic, stifling humidity in Vietnamese. Stifling prospects in German. Constructing continues in Mandarin. Ducks paddling by in Neapolitan back and forth in Nigeria. Minimal ambulance howl in Greek. Porsche flies by in Punjabi. Homeless placard flaps in Romanian, back and forth in Bantu. Teens in Jeeps in Persian. Picnickers gather in Hebrew. Ducks bobbing in Malaysian. Invisible 4G pulse in Norwegian, three F-15 streaking in Korean, back and forth in Somali, seeds, reeds, random swaying in Arabic, ducks take flight in Russian, 
beer cans snapping in Chiribacha, dark clouds gathering in Homa, bayou clearing in Choctaw. Jumpstart palms. I wonder too if, you know, jumpstart palms are worth it. I mean, palms meant to get it existential being itself for a moment, brief moment, stripped of social causality, not having to take a publicly recognizable position, not having to, you know, massage of an affiliation, but instead riffing on what's elementally human, what's fundamentally common between folks, instead of about folks, as proclaimed by folks. Jumpstart poetry that pivots around a few key words, words that for the moment, brief moment, hold the mystery, the puzzle of being in time on this planet or not even being on this planet, but wanting to. I wonder if jumpstart poems are a cop-out, or a necessary moment, brief moment, against cop-out, or maybe something in between, stuck, broken. I wonder if folks are almost always in between copping out, not copping out, copping out, not copping out, but play it like the one or the other. Certain. I wonder if jumpstart poems even exist, and if they don't, whether they should exist. You know, poems that pivot around certain words, words like being, folks, mystery, pivot. And if, and if they do exist, whether they wonder themselves about poems that wonder about not wondering, fending off the hounds of lassitude, indolence, and surrender, just long enough for jump poem to start it all. All right, this one's called Brown Lives. Brown lives, the phrase, as is, don't matter in Mexico. The shades are endless. Where draw the line? You'd go quite mad. What matters in Mexico is lana, cold cash. How much, how far the flow, what things, what folks you gather around you. Of course, colorism thrives in Mexico. Weighs in, tip scales, but saying and insisting. Brown lives, the phrase, as is, is sacred, is blurry, happy talk, won't supply the flow, the things, the folks you gather around you. The line, when drawn, would shift yearly, monthly. The line, the haggle, would matter to oligarchs a lot. The haggle would matter to academia even more. Brown lives, whole departments <laughs> thrive. Service lines, blurring oligarchs' long game. Still, though, colorism thrives in Mexico. It hurts. It works for some. For sure, some families have losers and winners. It's important to confront colorism, frankly. But Lana, go see, take in, don't flinch, draws line on top, down below, both sides, makes box. In Mexico, boxes matter, not lines that shift weekly, daily. You'd go quite mad, demarking where, jumping back, jumping over, vying to drag shit here to there and back, stuck in a box in Mexico, decaled with Brown Lives Matter merch, donated by happy oligarchs of oil, of telecom, of finance, beachfront empires, foreground to hillside slums, background to nervous middlings, frozen between undecided about lines, boxes, which matter and why, earning zeal, spending zeal, to audit Mexico, lindo, is necessary. The peso plunging today, 10%. And I'm gonna finish with two sonnets. And the first one is called Whittlers. Maybe just a whittler humanity, playing cards, zipping to Mars, calculus, making plans for the holiday, humming, reviving the half-dead, improving beer, limping along in old seminaries, 
repairing faith's cracks, unkeeping the look of everything inside you, or imagined a grand view of finagling a purpose. Then come the puppies, the kittens, the birds of no purpose, demanding devotion, and of course, 80 million new whittlers, of which a handful will whittle away on Mars, playing chess, executing codes, extracting the last plumes of lithium. This last one is called Gadget. There will be an end to this restless sea. But that time is not our time. It's the sun's. The moon's boring gray sands are part of us. We made them so. Less so, sunspots and flares. These timescapes interposed call for measure. You're a clock, as am I, without ticks. It's other sounds and motions assumed here that make for mirth or misery expressed, attempting to express, mostly rebuffed. Your phone is a rebuff aggregator. Earth skimming bipeds of all persuasions live by this greedy clock's demands, tick by tick. Billions of would-be poems go dark there. Eons before boiling seas vaporize. Thanks. I moved to Tucson in 1984 and pretty quickly became a studio artist in, in this area, not too far from here, and already you know, almost 40 years ago, I thought Barbia Williams was a, a legend. And I, I know now that she hadn't started much longer before that. <laughs> but I think by the power and beauty of her work and what she was doing being a strong addition of something no one else was doing in terms of her um, cultural and social vision for this art, in a certain way, uh, she was a legend and still is. When I look at Barbia Williams's bio and her uh, mission statement of the Bar Barbia Williams Performing Company, it wears me out. There is so much. It makes me feel like I have to work a lot harder than I am. So I'm going to read part of that. You know, Barbia Williams is dedicated to sharing ethnic dance, theater, and visual cultural traditions that derive from Africa and the African diaspora as an arts educator, performing, and visual artist. Currently, she is the artistic director of the Barbia Williams Performing Company. She is in her 21st year as a faculty for the School of Dance at the University of Arizona. She serves as the Managing Director for the BWPC Dance and Art Academy, offering classes, workshops, and residencies specializing in African and African Latino cultural expressions. Her performances seek to transfer her audiences to another world, rekindling spirits of missed opportunities. The Performing Company, Arizona's premier African-centered performing company, the emphasis is on African and African Latino dance, but also choreography, choreo poetry, cultural folklore, story dance, dance used to educate and bring attention to current events and social justice issues. The work includes face painting, body art, and history. Dance and drum classes are offered to all age groups and skill levels community and career-oriented artists. The mission is to teach, cultivate, promote, foster, and develop within the greater Tucson community, the state of Arizona, and the global society, 
and appreciation and understanding and a love of the performing literary and visual arts and to develop the interests of all of the people around to become involved in and supporters of these arts. This morning, I, I began my day uh, first with um, Zen Buddhist meditation and then listening to the fantastic uh, jazz musician Alice Coltrane's um, CD, Universal Consciousness. And I immediately thought, uh, Barbio Williams's work brings us a step closer to universal consciousness, brings us a step closer to the world around us and even beyond us, and to see that we are not only a part of it, it is a part of us, and we are a part of each other. For that, I think Barbia Williams is a legend. Please welcome Barbia Williams. Now, I didn't know they were going to say all those good things about me. That's so sweet. <laughs> I came to the right place, right? Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Rodrigo, right? Very much. Um, um, really appreciate. Um, I'm, I don't, yes, I was about to say, I think we need a couple of other. I don't want to be selfish with the heat. Right, that heat, that heat, that heat. Um, I want to just share some excerpts from some choreography that I was just really fortunate to work with. Um, just wonderful dancers at U of A, but also dancers that were dance majors, but also um, students, of, direct students of mine that continued to uh, dance with our company. And a lot of this was inspired by Catherine Dunham the legacy of Catherine Dunham, the, the, uh, the vision, the foresight of, of Catherine Dunham. She was, um, uh, uh, she's definitely an ancestor, but um, in 1935, she received the Rosenwald Fellowship. And you know, she's just, you know, like, what does it mean to be an African woman here in America, right? And um, so she went to Jamaica, she went to Trinidad Tobago, right? She went to Martinique, all in the islands that we call the West Indies, but we know that's not where Columbus really was. <laughs> that's not really where he was, right, okay? So, um, but, um, and then her, her spiritual home, she ended up in Haiti, or Haiti, right? And um, so a lot of this, and tonight's presentation, just in compiling some of this work for me and thinking about what I wanted to share with people, I, I call it join the, the evolution, join the evolution. So this first part of what we're gonna do is gonna be a part of the evolution, right? Um, that foundation of where some of my people come from. Uh, my father's DNA, we've been doing this wonderful DNA for the last five years. I, I realize there's nothing like that because you know you know that, well, my mother already knew that there was what was going on just because we know a lot of our ancestors. But my father's, um, through my uncle, the eldest member at that time living, um, we were, it's like it came back and it said Spain and Portugal. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I did this DNA for the African, right? I wanted to know my, about the African content too, because this is the family I'm feeling like is less mixed, right? So I wanted to get a real direct African connection and, uh, and I mean, I'm calling these people, I'm saying, hey, look, I, I want to know about you all. Is this really ours, right? Then I calmed down and I started thinking about the 700 years that the Moors occupied Spain and all the contributions that were, were generated as based on this Moorish occupation, right? For 700 years, there were a lot that's happened. But that's a whole nother story because I definitely did research about that. But again, my life and guidance is influenced by Catherine Dunham and because she she was a uh, not only a dancer a choreographer um, again like this visionary but um, she was uh, a scholar she was a researcher she wrote she's an author um, and uh, she started movies and, and she's just a real pioneer very much an activist also a social activist and this is where i came in i said she's got all the credentials everything i want right in my life so again without further ado i'm going to give you a little background on this 
And again, remember these are excerpts. These are some of these pieces are eight, some are 10 minutes, okay? It says this one um, is called Behind and Beyond the Door of No Return. I think we're familiar with that a little bit, the door of no return, right? This is where African people, this last time that they were ever, they were ever in their homelands, right? And I did have that experience um, uh, with some scholars here, uh, or there, I should say, um, in Ghana, uh, the door of no return. So um, this is called, um, Behind the Door of No Return is the cradle of the working class, their tales of freedom and servitude, kinship, and their relationships to nature and its spirit in ancient Africa. Millions of their stories will remain at the bottom of the ocean and never reach shore. Beyond, they manifest as patakes, scenarios nurtured through the sacred dances of the deities, the Oshun, Oguns, and the Shangos in Cuba, or Cuba. Others flourished and celebrated in the Escola de Sambas in Brazil. This, their fusion of this cultural legacy and dance styles express no return, no return, no return. But we understand that there's that spiritual connection, that agungu, that will always connect us to and thread us through to Africa. So again, this is some of the, some of these, there's about four dance majors that are a part of this. And you can move around now, keep it warm. Don't, don't worry about it, right? or thoughts about it, but the door of no return, it's, it divides the foundation of the past, their deities and the relationships that conscientiously flowed into the Atlantic uh, through Brazil and Cuba. Behind the door of no return is the cradle of world civilization, the Orishas, where the Orishas lie. I was uh, specifically, the one that I went to was in Ghana in West Africa, Cape Coast is the area that it's called. And um, I was with a group of people that were, that were scholars. I was like, I could not believe. Um, Adelaide Stanford, she was the um, superintendent of schools out of New York, Dr. Stanford, and Jennifer Lewis, the comedian, actress, <laughs> she was around. And I mean, there was just all of these really interesting people, Dr. Wade Noble, um, uh, doctor um, out of San Francisco State, um, Dr. Asa Hilliard um, out of um, Atlanta, 
uh, what is it, the University of um, Atlanta or something like that, something in Georgia. And um, so, you know, we're with these people. Here I am, you know, <laughs> the dancer lady, right, you know? But the dancer lady that studies the history, the culture, and the foundation of what we do. And um, so that's what it was so important to me to have that experience um, with that. Um, and we actually went into these dungeons. They're not castles, right? They're dungeons. We actually went in there and we did this whole transformation where we returned through the door of no return. You know, we're the descendants of the children that and the people that chose to survive the Middle Passage, that chose to survive the Jim Crow. And, you know, oh, it was interesting on NPR today, I think of today or yesterday, they were talking about the Mediterranean and how that it was this, this graveyard. And I had all, I have always, my thing was the Atlantic. I remember when I was in Cuba and I, I remember putting my feet in the water and, and I, I just felt like I was being pulled Pulled. And I mean, I was like, I got out of there really, really quick, right? And the same thing happened in Costa Rica. I, it was like there was a, a little boy, actually, that pulled us into the water because um, he was drowning. I was, you know, I, I went to um, Limon, right? This is outside of uh, the coastal area. And um, there was, there was um, a, a woman, actually, that I had met in the bank and uh, it was so interesting. So we went and Lamon is like with the area where all the black folks are, right? Okay, I'm trying to get, connect and see what's going on. Um, and so that was, um, that was um, uh, where we were there, but that happened too. And, you know, I'm taking care of these, this woman, she went to get something to eat and there were her two boys and my son was with me also, right? And. I'm counting, you know, I'm reading, relaxing, one, two, three, you know, read a little more, one, two, okay, there's the third one, they're up. Then all of a sudden it was one, two, one, two, and I'm like, where's this little boy? And I saw his arms just flinging, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> like, well, I'm taking stuff and I'm running into the ocean. This man, this really strong guy I mean he just like zooms I'm in the water right and I'm swimming towards this little boy and this man he just came and picked the little boy up and you know I'm feeling the current you know the riptide I'm like I'm like oh and anyway this is what really happened you all I have it on video actually too it's just like it was just so deep well I you know somebody gave the video to me and then the little boy was okay his mom came back you know, with food. <laughs> it's just a lot of, of come, there was um, traditional African early on, then there was um, Samba, there's various styles of Samba. You know, if you go to Rio, you've got all of that fancy, frivolous kind of, you know, you know, dress. It's beautiful though. Um, but I spent most of my time in Bahia, right? And, um, where again, the, the people of African descent, uh, uh, what is it, April the 12th, um, 1500, Pedro Alvarez Cabril, he came in there and he started this whole enslavement period. And of course, they just took off. You know, it's like the Quilombos, right? <laughs> you know, some people in, in certain areas of the world, they call them uh, the Cimarrones, right? And the, or the Maroons. They go to different parts, but they run up, they, lift, they leave all of that enslavement. And they run away and they start their own villages. So, this was um, some of the dancers that I had. Um, like I said, most of these dancers were in my dance class. Uh, the two men were both dance majors there at the U of A. So, this is more of like a, a samba, like some of the circle sambas that they do styles that I just picked up some of the um, traditional movements. So it wasn't like uh, in the Escola de Sambas, you know, where they have like, um, they dress up as, as like the butterflies, the mariposas, the right mariposas, so, or different figures and everybody has the same thing on. This was um, uh, more the traditional when they have um, uh, circle samba, right? Um, All right.
that one, um, again, uh, talks about, <laughs> it's called Women, Art, and Geometry. I don't think we really look at and um, reflect on the, the weaving of baskets and um, uh, the hair, the very intricate hairstyles um, of, of, of cornrows and braiding and the styles. But this man named Paolo um, Grides, um, he wrote a book called Women, Art, and Geometry, right? And I read it <laughs> and it blew me away. It blew me away. So I'm going to give you a little background on this. This dance reflects the cultural activities of South African women, South African women. So yeah, I think we think of the, the Zulu people down there in that area. We think of, uh, with the Gumbu dance, we think of um, the Indebele, right? The, the plosha, the clicking languages, right? So there's so much down there. So in the beating, the Indebele women, it's very much too, it's so similar to um, the indigenous people of our, the land that we live, love and grow and have developed our lives here in the, um, the Southwest, the sacred Southwest. Um, but um, the women, and also it's very similar to the, the Maasai in Kenya in that, in that area. It's just like some of the beadwork, um, the basket weaving also, the hair braiding, the tattooing, um, the or scarification, right? The mural decorations and the string figures I could not believe it. They were just so interesting. They bear a strong artistic and mathematical character because it is not always considered by academia. This does not render them less mathematical. Cameroonian mathematician and U of A graduate, Dr. Georges Edward Nyok, right? Pure, this is his quote. It's, he says, pure mathematics is the art of creating and imagining. That's a word, you all, right? Imaginating, I didn't make it up. He said it, since he's, you know, the doctor man, we're gonna take that for, okay? <laughs> imaginating, I kept looking it up, I didn't find it in a dictionary. So we put it in this, right? In this sense, black art is mathematics. Quoting H.G. Uh, Hardy, the famous English number theorist, a mathematician like a painter or a poet is a maker of patterns. It is his patterns, if his patterns are more permanent than theirs, it is because they are made with ideas and the mathematician's patterns, like the painters or the poets, must be beautiful. The ideas like the colors of the or the words must fit together in a harmonious way. Beauty is the first test. There's no permanent place in the world for ugly mathematics. <laughs> That's a quote. I love it. I love it. You know, my my grandson's a, a physics uh, major and a mathematics minor, and I mean, way over my head, right? Okay. And I'm like, I pay for the tutors, though. Okay. I love it. He says, uh, and I say, I'm sure this also applies to dance, also. So, without further ado, this music again. You know, you have to pull in. Miriam Makiba, she was so much an activist and um, she married uh, Kwame Nture, um, uh, another activist that um, came out of the, the States and uh, just really powerful. And these were people that, you know, were in my neighborhood when I was growing up and I got to go and, and see these people. And, you know, as a, as a young person, I, I was just, I couldn't leave the places that I ended up I don't know what took me there, but sometimes, you know, there's something bigger than you. There's these divine, you know, connections, something that pulls you, that pulled us out of the water, that pulled me out of the water. Um, um, it's just very, very interesting. So anyway, without further ado, so this again is mathematics, right? And that's my daughter, Bia, in front, I might add. <laughs> my son, Bea. He was playing and then he's a, a football coach though now, but <laughs> then we see what dance will do. I tell you, Miriam Makiba, Pata Pata. Yes. 
so that's that. And this is early wonders about the African presence in Mexico. I have had the opportunity to go to places in Mexico that you would not believe on the East Coast, right? Uh, and Vera Cruz and Tabasco and um, just other uh, over there. It's just like you feel so welcome. Um, but I went, I'm sorry. But um, I went on a, this was a, actually commissioned through the Arizona Commission on the Arts, I might add, give them some of that credit, right? But um, this is, uh, I'll read a little bit to you about this. This, um, This uh, early wonders utilizes dance fusion by the West African with Catherine Dunham's philosophy and technique to unravel the theories of the origins of the Omex or Omecas, right? Of Mesoamerica. Acknowledging their preliminary encounters. This is preliminary encounters that you're seeing right now. Later on, we see their contributions in agriculture, their seasonal op um, observations in developing the calendar, right? Stone carvings and pyramid structures. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Mexico City, right out what, Teotihuacan? Right outside, I mean, amazing. You go down in the southern part, um, uh, where was I, where was I? In, uh, uh, the Mayan pyramids were there. I mean, unbelievable. Just, and I read this book by um, uh, uh, this man, Horus. Uh, Horus, uh, this is his first name. And he talks about, he was talking about how it, the, the evolution started in Mexico and went back to uh, Egypt or Kemet, ancient Kemet. And he was talking about the 25th dynasty, which is interesting, in this uh, book. Uh, and just like, you know, uh, uh, most of us know and we're aware of the pyramids in, uh, in uh, uh, well, I call it Kemet, right, in Egypt. Um, but we're, uh, we see that, that there, all this is building and, and agriculture right now. Um, that's going on here. But um, this man, he had this horse, I can't think of his last name, but he was talking about the, how the pyramids, um, the evolution started back, and they were talking about how, you know, the ships, how they came back and forth. Now this last one, this is called uh, Clint's Healing Anoint. And this was an African uh, Latino prayer, right? Um, this is the finale. Um, again, it's an African Latino prayer dance to the elements of sustainability, earth, water, air, and fire. We ask permission to allow our current appearances of good fortune and all of us we're in i don't care how you feel about your life right now you're not in syria right you're not in turkey you're not in haiti okay you know we're not dealing with that 15 million people in california with all that recent flooding right this is our with our current appearance of good fortune to remain we wanted to remain right as current conditions demonstrate that events can be good bad or trouble knowing we each must take the responsibility individually and collectively to continue the sojourn of dance and to love and to love to love and nurture mother earth okay so but i want to say also this was dedicated to a friend of mine who had a shop right down the street too um ashira pace and she was a member of the Mami Wata Society. Some of us know pyramid. I mean, uh, not pyramids. What do you call them? Um, um, the people in the water with the fins. 
mermaids, mermen, right? Well, mommy water predates that, so you understand the legacy of that, right? Uh, and Ashira was a member of that, and she used to talk to us about it all the time. And um, this was also a part of dedicating this piece to her, because we know the, uh, the importance of water and how it sustains us. And her commitment to holistic healing and the advocate for the victims of domestic violence also. She worked with the Emerge Center. She worked with uh, the Tucson Center for Women and Children. That's where I worked and that's where I initially had met her. So without further ado, that's our progression is to go forward. So the reciprocation was happening at one point, but I have to really acknowledge those helmets that were worn. I don't know if you all could see them that well, but the helmets that were worn in Early Wonders, right, were researched based on those um, 20, uh, 27, I think they said, um, Omec heads, right? That, and, and they were just so interesting, the intricacy of them. And Mary Beth Cabino, uh, Cabino she was the one that did all the sewing and as we researched and worked with that too, but I was telling her this is what we need to make sure that each helmet that we have is, um, you know, talks about who these people were, right? Coming out of, there's so much interesting information. And, um, you know, some things people believe, some people, you know, want to, you know, everything is up for discussion. But I say, look at the people. <laughs> look at what they look like, right? Okay? Look who's in the, I mean, I just went um, to, um, what is it, Casa Grande, right up the street from here. And there's this whole African community there that you don't even think about in Casa Grande, Arizona, right? And I'm not, I'm talking about present and ancient, you know, because they got all the cowboys, you know, the, 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 they made names for themselves that came out of there too. So I gotta I have to tell you one more thing before I give you a thank you all for hanging out. Um, Early Wonders, you know where I got that name from? <laughs> I, I have a garden, right? <laughs> and I was planting these beets, and of course, you know, I'm trying to think, oh, what do I name this dance, right? And the beets were called Early Wonders. <laughs> and I thought, how appropriate. <laughs> what else can you name this dance, right? So again, my name is Barbia Williams, and it is a pleasure, and thank you, Charles, for, and thank you all from the organization for having Rodrigo. Thank you again for opening it up, making it happen, and all the work that you're doing also. Mr. Nola, man. <laughs> all right, thank you all.